Brilliant. Okay, right. International Women's Day. Let's do this. Here we go. So. Lovely seeing everyone filter through. And this is where loads of people suddenly join the waiting room. It's all good. <laughs> Hello, everybody. If you're here for the International Women's Day event, then you are in the right place. Congratulations, you made it. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> Lovely to see you all. How are you doing? Ah, CD17's in the house. Cool, cool, cool. Um, we were worried that you might not be able to get in, so that's all good that you're here since you're an important panellist. We kind of need you. Um, we are videoing this and it will be on YouTube because there's lots of people that wanted to come. Um, we, we sold around 95 tickets, so um, we know there's a lot of interest in this and we know that not everybody's going to be able to make it on the night. So we are going to be um, recording, it's recordings in progress, and we shall be sharing it on our YouTube. So that's all good. If you do not want to be on that uh, video recording, then obviously switch off the camera. Um, and if you're happy to have your face on there, we'd love to see your face. It's quite nice talking to faces as opposed to names on a yeah. screen. I find. Um, so we're going to kick straight off. I'm going to keep letting people in, um, but we're going to kick straight off because we've got so much to get through. Um, and I'm always incredibly over, overly ambitious with questions because when I get four women like this in a room, I have so many questions. I could, you know, it's the journalist <laughs> in me it just comes out. Um, this year, we're going to be discussing how we as women. Um, oh, we, I'm just going to mute. Person. If you can mute yourself as you come in, that would be awesome. Um, so everyone can just focus from listening to us. That's all right. Um, okay, so we're going to be talking this year about um, embracing equity in publishing, business and the creative arts. Um, because embracing equity is this year's International Women's Day theme. So please do feel free, as I said, to join in and put your questions into the chat box if you have questions for any of the specific panelists and obviously make it clear who you want to attribute that question to or if it's just a general one to, to us and everyone then we will all have a go at answering it um thank you to everybody who has donated money to um our charity partner which is the domestic abuse frontier support service which is a local charity they do amazing amazing things we are match funding so every time that somebody invests some money in um fundraising for them for via this event we are actually going to match that funding so so far we're about 100 pounds so if you do feel moved to give a pound or so then you will be very welcome and the link is in the chat box um so for those of you who don't know me i am helen lewis i am the director of literally pr um and it's a publishing pr and marketing agency which is here in the uk we've got clients globally so i started this business 12 years ago had a newborn in one arm, I had a toddler in the other. Um, I had years of journalism experience and marketing experience, absolutely zip in terms of publishing connections or experience, but knew that I loved books, knew that I wanted to work in publishing and thought, yeah, I can do this <laughs> in my naive way that I do things. Um, and I had loads of ideas and just kind of went for it. And thank God I did because now it's um, one of the best things I've ever done, frankly. And um, we're a team of seven. And we've worked on more than 500 books. Um, and I'm also the very proud co-founder um, alongside author Abiola Bello of uh, an indie publishing house called Hashtag Press and the Diverse Book Awards, which is now in its fourth year. And it's open to nominations until the end of May. So if you have a book that you want to nominate for the Diverse Book, Diverse book Awards, please have a look at that. Um, so I'm your host tonight, but I'm not going to be doing all the talking. I promise we want to hear from the amazing panellists. So I'm going to introduce everybody and... Um, hopefully you can see all their faces and uh and get to know them and please do like i say feel free to ask questions that's what tonight's all about a very empowering and hopefully positive lively discussion is what we're looking for from tonight so we've got dr susan doring who is the author of smart career moves to smart women how to succeed in career transitions this was published only literally a couple of weeks ago by routledge and susan is an international career and leadership coach who operates globally. She coaches individuals to achieve professional success and facilitates career development through training courses for public and private sector organisations. And I'm just going to let some more people in. Uh, Soraya Nair is currently the publisher at Trigger Hub. She oversees their three publishing imprints. So that's Trigger Publishing, that's Upside Down Books and it's Cherish Editions. 
and Saria has eight years of book publishing experience across non-fiction children's and academic. Dr. Gabby Pellicci is a professor and coach. She is uh, guiding individuals and groups towards wholeness using writing as medicine, which is very cool. She is the author of All This Healing Is Killing Me, which is her memoir due for release shortly from Mindster Media. She completed her doctoral work in transformative studies at the California Institute of Integral Studies with a dissertation on women healers and studied plant medicine with indigenous healers in New Mexico and Guatemala. She has been a university professor of integrative and holistic medicine since 2007. And we have CV17. Are you able to put your video on? Lovely. We can see you. Hello. Um, we've got CD17, who's originally from China. She moved to the UK at the age of 17, which is just amazing, on her own to study psychology at King's College London. She was born in a place that's known as the South of Clouds, which is an area with diversity of landscape, religion, culture, music and arts. Apart from writing amazing poems and taking incredible photos, she's also a techno music artist, DJ and painter. The Weights We Carry, published by Silverwood Books, is her first poetry collection, and it documents her incredible solo bike packing adventure around the Scottish Highlands and the Orkney Islands, a trip with a total distance of no less than 658 miles over 46 days, mostly wild camping. Hello! <laughs> um, so four incredible women, oh my god! Um, so this is just amazing. So just a very quick background to IWD. So IWD has been around for over a century, as most of you will know. The first gathering was in 1911. It attracted a million people, which is like pretty impressive for a first event, let's be honest. Um, but obviously now it is a real global thing. And embracing equity is the theme for this year. So equality means each individual or group of people is given the same resources or opportunities. Equity recognises that each person has different circumstances and allocates the exact resources and opportunities needed to achieve an equal outcome. I'm just going to mute your dad there, Soraya. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, okay, so basically, I think this quote perfectly sums it up. It's, it's from a lady called Susan Gardner. Um, equality is giving everyone a pair of shoes and equity is giving everyone a pair of shoes that fits which I think really helps sum it up. So we're going to get stuck straight in. And Dr. Gabby, I'm going to hit you first with the first question, if you do not mind, please. Um, yes. What does International Women's Day mean to you personally? And what would be your ideal way of honouring this day if you could choose without any limitations as to how to spend it? Yeah, well, I would choose to spend it with you. That's why I'm here. <laughs> I'm excited to be here with this amazing panel. And I'm excited to be one of your clients as well, Helen. And you're supporting me with my book, All This Healing is Healing Me and getting that out into the world and having that conversation around healing and healers and, and how we do that, how we support that process. And ideally, I think if this day and this movement can bring more resources towards equity and inclusion, that would be the best case scenario. And women need that on all levels. There's still a massive gap in resources, in salaries, in opportunities, in funding for small businesses. I mean, the list goes on and on. And so really we need actual actionable items and resources driven towards women. And the fact that you own your own business is phenomenal. And that is a great spotlight for other women to be inspired to start their own ventures, which is something that I think is critical in us having our empowerment and our financial freedom and highlighting these other women, you know, Susan talking about careers and Soraya talking about publishing. I mean, like this shows the quality of leadership and really gives other women uh, something that they can, you know, it, you know, aspire to do as well. But at the end of the day, I really think we need to put our money where our mouth is and we need women to actually have the, the resources and, and the opportunities to create that equity and inclusion. So yeah. totally. happy to be here. <laughs> I totally agree with all you've just said. Susan, would you like to continue that? 
Yes, with pleasure. And it's also, may I say, it's a great pleasure to be with you and with everybody and, you know, with these three other extraordinary women. Um, I'm almost, almost speechless uh, at their yeah. achievements, Please, <laughs> but, but promise not to be entirely <laughs> speechless. Um, Gabby's been talking about resources, absolutely. But I think we also need to use this day simply to stop and reflect and celebrate stop whatever we're doing celebrate the achievements of women both famous women and non-famous women the trailblazers but also remember our our mothers our grandmothers uh what they achieved for us yes. um but certainly also to remember that we're, there's still more to do. We've got to redress the balance, not only in the UK, but also worldwide. Um, I am very happy to spend uh, International Women's Day evening with you. I've just come from a conference um, where there were lots of, of very good women, very inspiring speakers. This was in, about the hospitality industry. Um, so one of the things that I would like to do if I weren't here this evening, I would go to a fantastic um, restaurant where there is a head chef who's a woman and yeah. sommelier or a sommelier who is also a woman and celebrate with my female friends. That sounds perfect. Let's do that next year. <laughs> <laughs> and CD17, would you like to unmute yourself and um, let us know what you what Women's Day means to you, but also how you would like to spend it if you could choose any way? Sure. Um... First, apologize. I'm still in a car. I got stuck in the traffic. So oh, I, I mean, look like I'm such a successful person. <laughs> <laughs> well, it does actually, because it shows that you're multitasking on a massive level. So yeah, it does show that you're a successful person. <laughs> okay. Yeah. My ideal scenario for celebrating International Women's Day is not having my period on this day. <laughs> <I'm curious. laughs> oh yes. <laughs> yeah. I just got my period and then I, I went for a meeting earlier in central London and the whole time I was like I, I wish like we get to celebrate this day but uh, like all these men cancelling like working schedules for, for women when they have period. Funny enough I had exactly that conversation with a colleague earlier and we were saying about how there are countries where you do get um, leave basically once a month and I was like that would just never I can I can never imagine that actually happening in this country and that's because there's such a misunderstanding around how it can be so debilitating to actually have a period and and men in particular who obviously can't understand it because they don't do go through it there's just that kind of feeling of I think there's a conception a perception of oh it, it it's just like a couple of days and you're fine it's just like you know you just it's like it's not it's a whole thing like it's the build up it's the thing then it's the build up then it's the thing after but also the cost is it's just so expensive to have a period, isn't it? Do you exactly. Know I mean? like, exactly. Anyway, I, exactly. I hear you, I feel you, I get that. I think we all we all get that. <laughs> <laughs> um Soraya, would you like to would you like to share your thoughts? Of course. Hello. Um, as everyone else has said, it's it's fantastic to be invited to do this and be alongside the other great panelists. So thank you to Helen for setting this up. It's great to be a part of it. Um, and yeah, International Women's Day, I feel like for me, it means sort of looking back on what's already been achieved and the struggles that women before us have sort of gone through, celebrating that strength, the determination that women all over the world have. I think it's super important for women to be able to come together and have a day and, you know, the rest of the year, of course, as well, to think about, discuss the achievements and hardships, prefer, prefer, uh, sorry, personally and professionally yeah. that they go through. I think it's super important to be able to then think about the future based on that. I think a day like this really highlights the strength and unity that women have. Um, in terms of how I would choose to spend it, you know what, this is pretty great, I will say. <laughs> this, is, this is up there for me. But um, similar to as Susan said, I think it would be great to 
be in a restaurant or you know even a pub perhaps and be surrounded by the strong women in my life and also the supportive men too shout out to my dad who is watching um and but yeah as I said I I feel like doing a panel like this is really important and as Gabby said as well the resources that women need to be able to grow and the work that needs to be done is super important I think we're on the way there and having discussions like this is super important and gets us to that place totally it is it is and we have to keep having the discussions and it, you know yeah it's great we're doing it on on international women's day um it'd be even better if we were doing it on a more regular basis i reckon um so in your individual experiences so in publishing in business in creative arts what is the one thing that you would change that you think could actually improve equity like have a direct impact on equity Soraya, do you want to kick that off Sure. I think, I mean, for me, I think embracing equity, it means sort of understanding that while you can give everyone the same opportunities, which seems great on the surface, you have to recognize that everyone has a different background. They have different circumstances. They've got different resources, which actually really means that the equality is way out of reach for a lot of people. And I think when it comes to really analyzing that, that's what's important and that's what will further create um, equality in time. Yeah. Um, when we recognise that the equity that everybody has, I think we'll have a better chance of general social equality. I think it means that we can help people um, and give people more resources. And I think that is the bottom line of equity. I think it's really being able to give everyone the same starting point based on their own individual starting point. Yeah. Um, for example, you know, with the books that I publish, their mental health, their well-being books, in a lot of them, they tend to be written by authors who embrace their equity um, instead of seeing it as, you know, a negative, which some people could. They're able to be open about it and what they need to gain um, to make equality. That's something that's, you know, something I completely support and I think is really important. Nice. <laughs> oh, sorry, that's my COVID cough. <clears throat> that was really helpful to, to have that in, insight from a publishing perspective I'm actually just gonna be just mix it up now and be really naughty and actually jump to a different question quickly um <laughs> research indicates that there's a bias a gender bias towards men sorry when it comes to which authors are published and which aren't and there's even some research indicating that books by women are on average priced lower than their male authored counterparts have you experienced anything like that um and what do you think publishers can do more of to stop this kind of crazy behavior i mean first and foremost that is super crazy yeah for sure the fact that that is something that's been studied and that is out there i completely hate i think it's the worst i don't want that to put any women off publishing at all um you know, I personally haven't experienced anything like that, especially at my current company, which, you know, we ensure one pricing is e um, equal for all authors yeah. and two as affordable as we can make it. But I definitely do think there is a gender bias towards men in certain genres, such as fantasy, business books. Those kind of stereotypes really run deep in those genres. Um, right. Those are just examples as well. So I'm sure there are others. Um, of course, there are women authors in these genres, but I do think the amount of budget in their things like marketing campaigns is possibly lower. And I think this is something that needs to be looked at from the bottom up in publishing companies. That's the way to start it. I think looking at it from right at the start of a publishing process, really outlining from the beginning what the budget is, ensuring that it's the same as what it would be for, for male counterparts. Like I said, especially in these genres where it's definitely obvious that it's not equal that's that's the starting point wow so i mean it's it's it basically you think you agree that you think that's probably that is possible that you, it is i do possible. yeah i i do agree yeah i think it's definitely something that is possible and something that i have seen in other genres just not something personally for me that i work on yeah. thank god um <laughs> CD, what, what would you say in, in terms of your individual experience? What's like the one thing that you would change that you think could actually have a, a real impact on improving equity? Um, I will speak for my experience in um, electronic music it's because I think it's more dominated by boys. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think, I think one thing I, I would change is 
and there's not really something I could change. It's more about the mentality, like about the dress dress code. Okay. It's like I yeah, I am in the in the techno scene, and then there was something very funny, like the <laughs> like we have a bunch of like cool girls being like, oh, we don't really like those girls who dress like to like impress others so we would dress something very basic to like really like to show like we're actually we're here because we're good uh, because our music because we're good looking we're like, really good at with our fashion taste but i think like in order to stop it everyone needs to like really just let it go of these thoughts like just wear whatever we want even like myself i would like intentionally trying to not dress something so fashionable like wow. some even though I love fashion, but yeah. sometimes I still like before I go on the stage, I would be like, okay, I better dress something basic, otherwise people would think I'm here. It's not because of my scale, it's because I'm so pretty. <laughs> and do you think that do you think that males don't have that same thought process before they go on and perform? I, I don't think so, because I see other ones. Oh, ours is like the in the in the rainbow family people they will have a similar thing as as girls but for like uh, normal boys not really they 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 can, they can just go and have fun and i'm really yeah. jealous of that yeah 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 yeah, yeah. and that's, that's that's exactly how how it should be right that's really interesting yeah yeah susan yeah. what about yourself uh with regard to what what i would do to the improve one the thing. yeah the one yes, thing, one thing. Yeah. well um as a career coach, somebody who has worked with hundreds, possibly even thousands of women who find themselves at a crossroads and are wondering how to move forward uh, and having heard their stories about the, the organizations that they work in, uh, the one thing that I would advocate for is that organizations, firms should make it a given that high potential women be offered a mentor and or a career coach. It's a relatively simple thing to do, but then we need to have the mentors, we need the advocates, we need the sponsors in all of the firms, in all the organizations. And these should be not only women, having a woman, a woman mentor is a good idea because that can be a role, you can be a role model. But having a man mentor is also really, really valuable because you then see the other perspective. Mm. Either both can open doors, can show um, how to navigate the system. Um, and this is that's the one thing that I really think would be really, really helpful. So uh, a lot of organizations do do it. I know that, but not enough. Yeah, I totally agree. I didn't have a mentor until about two and a half years ago. And um, it was one of those things where I really felt like I needed one, but I didn't know where to start to look for one or who would be the right person. And now I have found the right person. Great. And it is, it is a guy and he is amazing. And he yeah. has changed so much about yeah. everything, about how I work, how I live um everything he's been so amazing and um to the point where I can't imagine now I can't actually imagine doing any of this without him actually yeah. he's that, that integral and so that shows how important they are and I think it took Absolutely. me as a fairly intelligent person to kind of that long to work it out so I think if it was given as more of a standard I think that would yes. be a brilliant idea yeah I think it's a really good idea thank you thank you Susan and Gabby what would you like to add in terms <laughs> of your one thing let's see you mentioned in my bio that one of my beliefs is writing is medicine and I really do believe that and I really do believe that women need to tell their stories I really do believe that women need to share their truth yeah. they need to write their stories they need to own their stories they need to share their stories with others and the more that we do that, the more that we address this unconscious bias, you know, we've talked about it in a couple of different ways. We've talked about it in fashion and we've talked about it in, you know, what books are being published and we've talked about it, you know, in the workplace and career advancement, but we really have to shine a light on 
the way that we think about this and the only that way that we can do that is if we continue to express our personal experience and that experience is received by others and that we continue to have that conversation. And I really do think writing is a valuable part of that process. Yeah, again, just uh, in relation to that, I remember being in a meeting <clears throat> with somebody, a guy, and um, this is a, quite a while ago, but the, I did have children at this point. And uh, um, he said, oh, do you have kids? And I said, yeah, I've got, I think I only had one at the point. I said, yeah, I've got one daughter. But he said, oh, you don't want to be telling anyone about that. I was mm -hmm. like, well, he said, yeah, you don't, in, in business meetings, you don't want to be telling anyone that you've got kids. Because as soon as they find out that you're a mom, they're going to be like, oh, she's got other things going on. And, you know, you don't, you don't want them to know that part of your story. And I was like, pardon? This, you know, this is like 10 years ago. So it's not that long ago. And, um, and p part of me, even though I rebelled against it and, you know, I'm very open about the fact that I'm a mom and I've got kids and I've got a life as well as work, part of me still hangs on to that, like that. And, you know, and I think it's it's that is part of my story. But yet some people think that you should they should tell you what should be in your story. Right. Whereas. If yeah. You and as you story, share that, other women might like pop up and say like, oh, man said this to me and a man said that to me and a man said this to me and a man said that to me. And that's where we see these collective themes. And that's where we can identify like this is something that's not just happening to me. Yeah. This is something that's happening to women. And this yeah. is something that we can address because now everyone is resonating with your story and, and having a similar experience. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's fascinating, the whole kind of impact that one um, thing can have, one, state, one statement can have on your story, isn't it? Totally. I think that's why it's also so important that we as women, as a collective, have conversa group conversations like this, whether it be mm -hmm. with our friend groups, our families, all coming together on, you know, a panel discussion like this. So people are influenced in a positive way, like you're saying, rather than being influenced by those sort of drip fed comments by people who really in perspective don't matter, you know? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> they don't matter. Um, if anyone's got any questions, throw them into the chat box and um, we can either filter them through um, over the next half an hour or we'll try and do a bit at the end. I have got loads of questions. So if you haven't got any, I'll take all the space, <laughs> but um, please do feel free to ask a question if you want to. Um, CD17, I just want to ask you, I'm really fascinated by um, the fact that you've obviously spent 17 years in China and then you've come over and then you've just done this massive journey around Scotland on your own. Did mm -hmm. you did you did you come across any sort of resistance or criticism or hurdles or kind of, oh, my goodness, you're a young woman on your own around Scotland? Was there any of that or, or did you just kind of just bomb around on your bike and have a great time? I have to say, like. In, in the re reality, not in my head, I had a great time. I met so many people. I met so much friends along the way because they're so impressed. Like, oh, I did it on your own. So inspiring. <laughs> and they all want to like be like, talk to me, be my friends. And it's all good. Wow. Apart, my mom, she was so angry. She was like, <laughs> oh, well, if someone's going to kidnap you. And oh. I'm like, well, what? Yeah, stuff like that. And then I found what is really torturing for me, the difficult thing is in my head. Because right. I've been told like, oh, you're probably going to meet some creepy person. They're going to kill you. And when I'm doing wild camping, especially the first night, I couldn't sleep. I was like, uh, yeah, what if someone comes to stab me? What if some, you know, someone nearby who's like really insane and I will experiencing something like so bad. And um, also like, because I don't really have like an example of like a girl like example in my in my life be like oh I've done it it's so easy or it's like it's challenging you can do it but it's always like someone like okay so challenging and uh, like like someone's like a, a boy and then like they have like really good um how to say like fitness level and then yeah. when I was cycling like there were many days I was like okay today I need to cycle like more than 80 kilometers and then um, I found it hard to, to accomplish it because I, I don't know if I can do it but it's also nice because once I get to the number I'm like yeah I can do it it's better than none yeah absolutely do you know what yeah. though, how amazing to say I don't know many people in truth that can say I did something that I had no um point of comparison with like that is so amazing to me because we live we live our own versions of experiences 
but they're usually quite common experiences with other people do you know what I mean whereas you've just gone yeah. I'm gonna go from China to UK and set up home in London and go to university and then I'm just gonna go and spend you know nearly two months biking on my own around Scotland I mean that's that to me is 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 amazing and I'm and I'm you know I'm really glad that nothing bad happened to you and I'm really <laughs> glad that you didn't have any bad experiences because you were a girl going around on your own um do you see do you see any differences between gender equity in China versus gender equity in the UK or is there anything surprising about the way that females are treated in the UK that maybe you weren't expecting um I would say in in China it's um it's definitely like <laughs> not as good as here like in terms of uh, equality like uh uh, since since I was kid, because I'm always really adventurous, yeah. doing lots of stuff, and then I get a lot of shame about being adventurous. Like, what, especially like in my in my love life, like when I was in, in high school, there was like no one wants to ask me out, <laughs> and I always thought like, is that because like I'm not good looking? Is that because like I'm not a, a fun person? And then. After I moved to the UK, I realized it's because in China, we have such a standard, like you have to be, you know, like really soft, you have to more like, um, how to say, easy to handle sort of vibe, then you can probably like more popular in the in the market. Wow. But um, once I moved here, I, I, <laughs> it's so funny, like, because I, I, um, I didn't say this, it's the... Um, I always can't pronounce her name properly. Uh, both wife. Yes, that was the person where you know, the second sex. Like, like we tend to um, how to say hook our self worth on how popular we are um, right. along like among men. I'm sure men does the same, but like I think we our case is more how to say intense. So, well, since I, since I moved to the UK, I feel more um, confident with myself like doing these um, non-girly stuff like I love electronic music I did boxing for four years I do this sports stuff I get lots of support and I, there's definitely more times to meet like girls like me and I feel really yes. happy and there's actually one thing I wasn't so happy about in in electronic music scene because in China I get lots of shame they were like oh you do this because you you want attention you want you know like they, they'd be like oh you it is there's no appreciation on you're doing these because you know you you want to show someone like you can be free to like you know a girl on the stage and then people like like you because of your music um and then i come to the to the uh, to the uk and there was a few times we were doing um like festivals and stuff and i realized <laughs> people let me to play in a like important time not because not really because I am um, good with what I'm gonna do because I'm a girl. And then that is the politically correct side going nowadays. <laughs> and they were like, uh, I feel like I've been used as a tool to like promoting this. Oh, so wow. I think, yeah, real equality is like, no one talk about it anymore. And uh, you know, you, you, you play because you're good, not because which gender you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not because you took a box almost, yeah. Yeah, Very yeah. Thank you. That I mean, all of that was just again. I, I mean, we will talk more obviously because we're working with you. But I have lots of questions. Yeah, I think it's fascinating. Um, <laughs> Susan, um, you actually your work is partly inspired by your own experiences. Or I would imagine quite heavily inspired by your own experiences. So you retrained as a coach um, uh, during some kind of life change, really. So you, you, your kids are grown up. You've got divorced. So what kind of um, advice would you give to a woman at a similar sort of life stage who probably feels a little bit stuck in a rut and is a bit nervous about making a career change because there's a lot of other change going on what based on your own experience and helping loads of other women what would you say is the best way to manage that transition that fear ah yes there's a word isn't it the fear it, of failure I think is in particular quite yes, a big one yes um I think the best piece of advice, the most important piece of advice is to believe in yourself. To remember all those times that you have achieved something, that you have succeeded. And 
build on those, grow your confidence. We know that there's a huge problem of self-confidence with very, very successful women. Yep. If you ask them, you know, they say, well, you know, but I don't really know how to do this. Yeah, I'm winging it. I'm Just winging looks it. as though I can. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and you hear this again and again. And, and, and as a coach, as somebody who has actually... I was very, very fortunate. I had parents who believed in me and who gave me the message that I could do anything I wanted as a, an only child, as an only, as a girl. Um, but, and, and, and I, and I, you know, I took that message. I embraced that message and I have been able to flourish through that. But I know that there, through my coaching experience, that there are many, many women who still have this self doubt. And this is what, you really do need to overcome. You have to believe in yourself. A mm -hmm. um, couple of more pieces of advice. You really need to do your research. You need to know where you want to go and uh, reach out to people. That's pro probably also the most, uh, the second most important thing. Get support. Yeah. Find out what's going on. Use your network. Mine your network. And I see we have a we have a um, a question from Kathy in the uh, chat. Yeah. Recommendations for women who are attempting to break into non traditional businesses that women have encountered barriers uh, in the past. Will you break through those barriers by doing exactly that? You believe that you have what it takes. You know your own abilities, but then you've got to sell yourself. You've got to go yeah. out there and network find out what people need and that's the way that you that, that you really do it you know you've got the knowledge be strong in that knowledge um you know uh, it's networking particularly nowadays of course there are so many really strong women's associations uh Particularly, I don't know what sort of um, businesses you're thinking about, Kathy, but in, for example, in the STEM professions, there are really strong women's associations for each of these. Get involved, go to their events, go to the conferences, talk to people. That's how you move into the area that you want to work in. Yeah, I mean, my personal experience of moving into publishing, like I said, I didn't have a clue was yeah. that I went to the London Book Fair and just talked to everybody. Um, I am not very good at going into a room where I don't know anybody and trying to make conversations with people that are in little groups. You know, that horrible feeling of like, I feel like I'm going into sort of the playground at secondary school and, and you're the person, you're like the new kid. I, can't, <laughs> I really struggle with that. But what I do find better and better at is going into like a seminar listening to the speakers and then maybe like chatting to the people around me or like going up to the speakers and stuff so you, you find the thing that so networking as a whole is quite daunting I think for a lot of people mm -hmm. women yeah. men whoever and I think that um it's finding the sort of networking that actually works for you so it doesn't have to be that stereotypical walk into a room for people you don't know and just suddenly but into a conversation it could be like I say going to a seminar or it could be doing online networking like these sorts of events or you know there's lots of different ways of doing it that isn't quite so scary I think one tip about walking into a room full of people you don't know yes look for the person who's standing on her own and go and talk to her because she will be really happy <laughs> yeah that's a good that tip you saved her from being alone <laughs> and you yeah, often right. find that she's the most interesting person in the room sure yeah no nice. I would like to say that that's actually that's me <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine being you being at a networking event we'd just be like where's the bar <laughs> <laughs> that's what, when I saw Helen at London Book Fair last year I said should we should we go for a drink if only we had time <laughs> <laughs> this year we will sure. um Soraya, as you're talking, why don't we ask you a question? Um, so what, I, what I'd love to know is what do you think is the biggest challenge that's facing women in publishing today? And that could be um, authors or it could be women who are actually working in publishing, however you want to answer it. It's an it, interesting question. <laughs> um, I think there's definitely a lot of issues that face women, I think ageism can definitely be an issue 
Um, interestingly, I feel like I personally suffer from reverse ageism, if that's, you know, a thing. Um, yeah. and the fact that I'm 28. I'm a publisher of three different publishing imprints. I'm aware that, you know, I'm, I'm quite young. <laughs> Um, and I feel like I've personally experienced the feeling of feeling overlooked and underestimated a lot. And I think it comes with the fact that I'm a woman that's young. It's not the fact that if I was a man that was young, I don't think I would be yeah. previously looked at how I have felt. Um, I tend to feel, you know, in the past, the need to work twice as hard as well because of that, um, which is frustrating because I think if I you know, I'm in a senior leadership position now and I wouldn't be in this position if I hadn't have, you know, worked hard enough to have the people believe in me that put me in this position. Um, but I'm also aware that at the same time, I want to prove myself and perhaps that's a personal issue of mine, but I'm very keen on making sure that I am aware, yeah, I'm just there making sure that everything is as it should be with my team and everything like that and the way that that comes about is it comes down to me still needing to work twice as hard because I think I'm a young woman um one thing I will say though is within the last you know six months or so when I've been in this position the support of my managing director my publishing team around me it's really helped my confidence in this aspect um as you can see it's obviously a sore point sometimes um but I would say because of that there's obviously proof that there are people in publishing who do recognize the challenges that women face obviously this is just one issue yeah but these are just this shows there are people working to improve it and hopefully this continues with other biases I definitely think there are a lot more none that I personally can comment on from my own experience but from seeing it from a different point of view there definitely are a lot of things that need to be improved on but I think it's <laughs> from a place of just one person and then it grows into a team of people but yeah. in publishing I definitely see that there's a lot more going on behind the scenes which is good to see yeah and you know what as you're talking people are starting to comment and sort of resonating with what you're saying and I had the same feeling I had exactly the same feeling and actually it's one of the reasons why I left um working in a an office environment um because I was constantly overlooked for um opportunities and promotions because I was under the age of 25 when um the people that were getting them who were like maybe 30 or 35 were not giving anywhere near as much effort didn't have the same skill set blah, blah 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 and it was clearly they just thought she's too young she can't handle it and um, Zara said I get exactly the same um as Soraya's regarding age I've worked in publishing for 15 years in my mid-30s and just a few years ago I was asked if I was enjoying my work experience oh my god Zara oh my god I feel wow. for you honest that I can imagine that's the most <laughs> frustrating thing I feel like it's just so underestimated and it, it, I imagine it comes from again the fact that like if you were a man in that position it would probably not be the same I can't imagine yeah I don't, I, I don't think a man would be asked if he was enjoying his work at, <laughs> at all but yeah I, I feel for you. um and Gemma's saying I relate to that um, a feeling of having to prove yourself to earn your place is definitely a big challenge for women um mm -hmm. And Susan, you've probably seen that in your coaching quite a bit of that kind of having to feeling like you have to go above and beyond. Sometimes I think feel like women feel like they have to go above and beyond because they are doing multiple other things. And so they kind of when there's that guilt of, oh, but I'm doing this, but I'm also doing that. So when I'm, I've got to kind of do extra in the work to kind of prove that I'm committed and focused. Is that something you've seen? Have I just made that up? Or is that you? Absolutely, Helen. Absolutely. Time and time again. I mean, I can think of one, I can think of several coaching clients, but one particular, I mean, who was an absolutely stellar uh, manager running a big office, actually, uh, you know, in a, in, a country, in a foreign country and uh, two daughters, husband in a different place because that was how it was set up yeah. uh, so running basically her family as well in a very difficult environment and she was running on a treadmill all the time you know it was uh, and always had felt that she had to do more and do more and do more and I remember that I mean I was coaching her but I asked her to talk to her manager and her manager actually said you 
can take a break. You're doing so well. He was a very, very supportive manager, which was wonderful uh, to experience. And he said, let go, let it go. But it was, it was, she was driven by this feeling that she had to always give more. Yeah. Um, and it's one of the things that you actually have to learn as a woman to be able to say, I'm going to let it go. Even if it's not perfect, you know, it's the 80 20 rule. If you do 80%, you've done brilliantly. And we have to learn to accept that. Yeah, that takes a bit of learning, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> she says. Um, <laughs> Gabby, you were named one of the top 100 women of the future in 2022 for your work in emerging technologies. Um, this, to me, in my perception, is a very male dominated space. Maybe you disagree. But what advice would you have for someone who identifies as female and wants to work in that sort of tech web space, but are maybe concerned about um, inequality and inequity? Yeah, I think the tech is similar to some of these other industries that we're talking about, corporate industries and publishing industries. And the ladies have already said so many powerful things like your network. Like when I got into technology, it just sort of happened by accident. I met someone who needed a consultant. I had the expertise. I came in and started consulting. I immediately saw how strange the culture was. In Miami, we call it bro culture. I don't know if that's a term that they <laughs> use in the UK. You get now. <laughs> Bro you, culture, you know <laughs> so like that's like the culture and so what you would see is that the women would go off and have their own support networks and have ways of uplifting each other I saw in the comments someone asked about that and what it would be is we would create a whatsapp group chat or a telegram chat or a special meetup for women in technology and we would download to each other all of the intel that we had about everything about scholarships about grants about opportunities wow. about job offers about let me introduce you to this person I'll introduce you to that person and we just created like a strength among ourselves so that we could counter that experience of culture and it created some headway but the reason I mentioned in my first comment that we really need to direct more resources at the end of the day only two percent of startups in Florida um are funded for women so 98 percent of the startups being funded in my state are all founded by men. And you could say maybe that it was accidental if it was like 70, 30 or like 60, 40. But when, when you have statistics that are that dramatic, mm -hmm. it's just like, this is like, this is a pervasive, this is like a pervasive biased situation. Mm -hmm. So even the women are working towards equity and supporting each other, uplifting each other, sharing resources, it's still not enough. There's still a lot more action that has to happen, which is why I just, I always come back to action and following the money and who's being funded and how are they being supported with the things that are really going to create the growth and the strength and the scaling and everything that's happening with a male founded companies. So. I mean, yeah, that's that's those those stats are very similar over in this country. Because when we've done um, work trying to get funding for different things we've been doing, it's you know you, it's, as soon as you start scratching the surface, especially around <coughs> private investment, it is it's it's very skewed uh, to one particular gender. And um, you worked as a model in your early career. What was that like from a gender <laughs> equality and equity perspective I, I mean that could fill a whole hour no doubt <laughs> don't don't put your daughters in modeling don't do it don't put your daughters in modeling my parents put me in modeling when I was like six seven eight years old I started in the beauty pageant circuit I did all the beauty pageants for like a decade then I got a modeling contract in New York and I worked as a fashion model and it's a grooming it's like a grooming that happens that teaches you that men have the power and men have the money and your value is how you look and your value is being pretty and you know, CD mentioned a couple of times about like how important that physical appearance is. And it took me decades after leaving to unlearn that I had value that wasn't attached to the way that I looked and that I didn't need to monetize my beauty and that I had value beyond 
you know, my appearance, I had to unlearn all of those things because wow. I spent so mm-hmm. long just like in the beauty industry. And I now I have I, I have some resentment towards the beauty industry in general and the way that it continues to undermine the confidence of women and tell all the women how they have to fix their face and they have to fix their breasts and they have to fix their butt and they have to fix all the things and all of this needs to meet a certain standard. I have a quite a bit of a resentment against the industry in general because I don't think it has our best interest. And I think that they can they generate more revenue, the worse that we feel because we spend more money when we feel bad to try to look the way that we think that we need to look. Um, so it was an experience. It was a learning experience. It taught me a lot about self-esteem, body image, eating disorders, you know, the whole industry in general. And um, yeah, I don't recommend putting your daughters into the beauty industry. I mean, that is that I mean that's obviously in the book by the way folks but um it's for me I find that fascinating because there is this um misconception around it of like oh it's so glamorous oh it's so fun oh it's so you know and it's like then you sort of you actually see the other side of like the reality of it and I feel like that's the case for quite a lot of stuff do you know what I mean it's like there's this like perception of if it if it's like really glamorous looking and really like woo it probably has an underside <laughs> like do you know what I mean it's like I don't know there just seems that kind of Absolutely. thing that happens in in the world but wow that is I mean yeah we will definitely dig into that <laughs> a bit more, uh, in the PR campaign no doubt but um I've just I've just noticed a comment which is quite um frustrating to be honest for as uh, for a woman um where you kind of get asked if you're emotionally okay and things like that in meetings um because you know you're a woman so are you emotional and I think let's maybe just end on a little bit of a discussion around that because first of all what's wrong with expressing emotions right I don't really see that that's a problem but um why why is it okay for men to ask women if they're feeling emotional but if we ask them that question it'd be like whoa like it's just so mismatched in terms of responses around expression of feelings and emotions and I haven't thrown that in the questions that I prepared for you but I just think it'd be a really good one to end on what are your thoughts anybody who wants to jump in please do I want to share a quick resource there's a book called the mask of masculinity and there's a film that's referenced in the book and it talks about the conditioning of men and how men are systematically conditioned to suppress repress ignore their emotions that the the only acceptable emotion that a man can express is anger and it's a really powerful film to create some empathy towards their journey of their relationship with emotions and and what often causes them to relate to us in the way that we do and so I'm happy to drop it in the chat if you guys want to look it up it's really yeah I'm just going to look for it now actually I'll I'll be interested in that as well yeah sure I'd like to pick up on what um uh our listener um, has written um, that uh, she had spoken up about something she felt was wrong. And that was when the the male colleague asked her whether she was okay emotionally. Mm. And I think what is really important in this sort of situation is to address it, address the problem, address the issue to say, I am feeling emotional, I think you would too, because this is an issue that is wrong. Something Mm -hmm. happened that was wrong, we need to talk about this. Uh, You know, what we tend to, what sometimes one tends to do is to then avoid the issue, say, yes, I'm actually feeling fine, right? But it was the issue that made the person perhaps feel not not very, you know, feel concerned and not very happy. And so it was the issue that needed to be addressed. I completely agree. I think as hard as it is in that moment to address something directly, I think it's a quick fire thing. It's like ripping off a plaster. As soon as you do it, you've done it. Let's move on from it in a way, at least you can. You've done what you can say. Um, and I think the sooner that you say something, I'm not okay with that. I don't appreciate what you've said or, you know, saying it in terms of, yes, as Susan said, I am feeling emotional because of X, Y, Z. I think saying it straight away will have a long-term effect. Yeah. 
And one of the other um, people on the call talked, asked about um, how women can support each other uh, in professional environments. Well, that's exactly the sort of situation where other women could speak up and support the person and support you, right? There are lots of ways that women can support each other in a professional environment. And you all know the adage that there's a special place reserved in hell for women who don't support other women. Um, but <laughs> You know, you you can mentor, you can offer support, you can buddy up with people, you can show them the ropes, um, and all of these things will be helpful. And you know, you can simply ask, "Are you okay?" Um, you know, I mean, CD was talking about you know having a period at at at, uh, at work. Well, you know, if somebody else says, "Look, you must be feeling really awful. Wouldn't you just like to sit down for a bit or take some time out?" Simply mm -hmm. say these things. Uh, I think this can be helpful. Yeah, Didi, again, I completely agree. Didi, did you want to add anything to that? <laughs> Agreed very oh, much. Um, <laughs> there was one other question. That we, there was one last question that's just come through, and we've got a couple of minutes to answer it. Um, so Rebecca saying a great session thank you in my experience and she puts in brackets I am older I have found that women have been successful or at least perceived to be if they act or display what are considered male type behaviors for example being ruthless tough-minded etc do you perceive a shift in this are you valuing other characteristics so yeah I mean I, I've definitely seen I've, I've seen lots of women try to emulate male characteristics at, at leadership position things and that's the right thing to do and it's clearly inauthentic to them and they're struggling with it but it seems to happen still in my experience yeah I agree I think it definitely it happens a lot and I feel like the pressure to act like that comes from those sort of higher up male colleagues mm -hmm. and that's why it, it continues is because women feel pressured to and that's something that completely needs to be eradicated um I definitely think having a strong female group of people around you um, in a working environment completely helps and having those conversations that Susan and Gabby and CJ have all talked about I think it's really important to be able to have that I know it's cringe but like camaraderie I think it's yeah. super important to be able to build those personal relationships with people and having that then eradicates that pressure from you know men and that higher up of those characteristics because I think those are very male dominated and I don't think those are things that perhaps naturally come to a lot of women and you know me personally that's not how you know I work with Helen on a lot of different with a lot of different authors on different books that's not how I do business that's not how I would tell people to do business either I think especially with publishing it's such a personal industry that I think being yourself says a lot I think I've made the best connections in this industry with strong women and strong men through being myself and yeah. let me tell you I am the least sort of aggressive and I'm not ruthless I'm I would say I'm not tough-minded either <laughs> I'm a very easygoing person I think it says a lot if you're yourself so don't feel pressured to ever be someone that you're not 100% Unfortunately, I think also that trends are changing, that strong women leaders are more and more acting uh, in a way that is not traditionally masculine or this ruthlessness, tough minded, directional, et cetera, et cetera. And it's one of the things that I talk about in my book, Smart Career Moves for Smart Women, how women can lead uh, in a way that is empathetic, that is supportive, uh, yes. that is communicative, and these are the things, these are the qualities that women have, and they they've been you know they're almost ingrained in women most most of the time, and these are the ones that you need to put on show, and be a good leader at the same time. Yeah. Here, here. I just asked Susan, can you post a link to your book in the chat as well? I would love to take a look. <laughs> what I'll do is I'll, I'll, try, I'll try. If you if you guys carry on chatting, I'll just quickly do a little bit of admin and I'll do that for you all now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you're you. very welcome. So 
is there anything else anybody would like to add? Does anybody have any other questions that they want to throw in at the end here? I'll just add that I think that uh, female entrepreneurs are the ones that are leading the shift with the feminine versus masculine traits. It's I think it's significantly harder. No, I was on a webinar. It's okay. I think it's significantly harder to be a female in a like organized structure and to be disruptive in your wardrobe and in your attitude and in your leadership. I think that's a lot more challenging. And I think female entrepreneurs, they're able to create the culture. Like Helen, you create the culture around you for yourself and all of your employees. And, you know, you give the people around you more permission to be more feminine whatever that means to us or yeah. have those you know empathetic communicative you know kinds of traits so i think really female entrepreneurship is a powerful force in in this in this paradigm shift i couldn't agree more and in fact of course what we are seeing and as the mckinsey report from last october showed very clearly women are leaving organizations more and more to set up to become entrepreneurs to set up yeah. their own businesses and that is one of the reasons they can choose how to lead how how to um how to manage their own company how to manage their team right and that that's certainly true I'm just trying Susan, to can I just come in and say something? I loved a quote in your book, actually, which I think sums up the um, the difference between the empowerment of women in business at certain different times of their life. And I'm just going to read it because I just think that it's just perfect and it sums us all up so well. And it's where you say the role that a woman's career plays in her life is rather like one of the themes of a symphony. It enters at a designated point, may even play a dominant role for a while, but then subsides and is heard perhaps as echoes or other parts of the orchestra or in a different key. In essence, women tend to fit their career around their life and not vice versa in a way that men do not. And that is so true for all different elements. I just think that I've never seen an analogy like that before i think it's brilliant thank you <laughs> thank you diana thank you well what a lovely way to end and we didn't even plan that so thank you lady di um obviously for those that don't know diana works at lit pr <laughs> um, i just want to say a massive heartfelt genuine thank you to soraya to dr gabby to susan to cd because you know this is quite a thing to put yourself out there and talk about these issues and uh and there's a lot of work that goes on you know thinking about the questions thinking about the answers thinking about you know, what you're going to say and committing to this time and uh and so it's just it's just from from me to you thank you very much but I think also looking at the um comments I think everyone wants to you know if we if we're in a room we'd all be clapping you basically now and going woo but we're not all in the room um feel free to unmute yourselves and whoop as much as you like um, but, uh, thank you so, so much um, um, i had my camera off earlier as well because i had my 11 year old daughter sat beside me for a little while between uh tutors and clubs she was just throwing some dinner down her neck for those of you that can't tell i'm in a mobile home at the moment because i'm having some work done inside so you can hear the rain but she sat here and she said wow mum they are all brilliant these ladies oh. so, oh. she thinks yes. you're all brilliant <laughs> she okay. thinks I've got a really cool job so there you go <laughs> well, I'm she'll be right. a strong independent woman as well <laughs> exactly exactly it's what, what it, that is so true we could have also talked about that the next generation and oh yes and pass Absolutely. on to them next time ladies next time <laughs> maybe next time we'll do it in a in a restaurant <laughs> with plenty of wine and food and we'll just have a great big party but thank you so much everybody go off and have a lovely evening and um, please do check out thank the links you. as well and so I've put the links into uh, the three books and also into Soraya's publishing house so you can see everything but thank you for joining us everybody thanks for your questions thank you thank so much, you so much. really appreciate you all and I will see you thank all you, soon Helen. take care thank you thank you bye bye bye, bye. 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 bye.